So welcome to the, the live show. And tonight what I've got going on is we gotta work on this set. And there's probably, well, there's a few things I need to do. Um, first off, I had to find some clay that would be good for the, the tree color. So uh, I've got a big box off to the side here of different colors of brown. And I think that these two colors are probably pretty good. Let's see here. Also got the base brown, but I think this is too light. So, hmm. Wow, so tonight might be the first time I actually use Puppet Putty for uh, for sculpting. <laughs> so anyways, uh, so Ron Cole has been talking to me in the chat. And um, so he's been working for John Lemon Films, which is a, which was actually my first, the first place I actually worked uh, in stop motion in North Carolina. And so he said that um, he finished the first segment and uh, let's see here, so... The first segment is done and there's two more to go and there's tons of rig removal in Photoshop in the first one. The next two should be much easier straight animation. Cool. Hey Puff Puff. <clears throat> Welcome to the show. So yeah, it's really cool to hear that they're still doing stop motion after all this time and you know, that's really awesome. I mean, there's not too many places that have stuck with stop motion for so many years. I mean, just think of, you know, even in California, all the different studios that have switched hands and people that have started studios and, or even just, you know, on their own tried to do animation and, and gave up. And so it is actually surprising to hear that, you know, even if it's just one person that sticks with it for more than like 15 years, if you've done that, that's, you know, you are, you are a rarity, honestly. So I think, you know, California and the UK are, are the only two places where people really, well, where the majority of people that do animation are. And there's also, of course, Portland, which is home for Leica. But, um, wow. Let me see here. So anyways, uh, so in case you guys haven't watched any previous episodes, uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm extending our first set and so this is the house that we built for the the first mother character and she uh, ventures outside to her tree which is supposed to have lots of apples and everything but the tree is dead and uh, there's going to be a crow up here that eats a, a dead apple and then she's going to look across over to the next set which is going to be this and so she looks across the, the little creek here and we'll see a tree with lots and lots of you know lush apples and everything and she wants to feed her family so um so this tree is what we're going to work on so i have like you know all these like three branches or so big branches coming off here now the bottom of the tree is going to have grass around it so i think what i'll do is i'm going to probably take this and kind of flatten it a bit. Got some of our dark brown. So I made this dark brown using uh, just the base brown, which is like this. It's Van Aken brown clay. And I mixed in green with it, dark green. And so that's the result is you get a darker brown, basically. So if you want to make brown, it's uh, red and green together it makes brown. So the more um you know you can make like a, a reddish brown by adding a lot more red clay uh, you can make it darker using green and depending on the kind of green that you use you can get a bunch of different shades but this is the shade that i think was works pretty well and i think here you see what i did so when i made this other tree there's definitely different shades of brown in there so I either can't really remember because it's been about a year since I made that, but has it really been that long? Or at least six months. But uh, anyways, I either mixed in clay, but I didn't mix it in all the way, and it just kind of 
um, is a marbleized kind of brown, or I added it. <laughs> I can't remember which, uh, but you can add it afterwards. So, anyways, uh, <clears throat> oh, <laughs> well, that's cool, Puff Puff. So you're you're new to stop motion. And Ron says, this film can be related to Forest Story, John Dodd's film from all those years ago, which was also about a battle over apples. Yeah, that is like a, a classic. I mean, back in the, like, like the 1980s, that was sort of the film that everybody was looking at in, uh, was it Cinefax or I, I can't remember, Movie Magic or something. Um, not Movie Magic. Um, what's the other, other magazine? There was like Starlog. There are all these magazines from for filmmaking that you could pick up, and that's actually that was a really funny one. All right, so I'm gonna move this out of here. I'm gonna sculpt this not on the set. I'm gonna add it later. So let me put this where put some space here. Not work. All right, so I'm going to actually flatten this out. Alrighty. Flatten it or roll it out. Rolling it out might be a better idea. Let me put this in my pasta machine. this Oops. oh was it cinemagic cinemagic yeah I mean those were the days when it was really hard to find information about stop motion so if anybody out there got anything like John Dodds when he um, got his film in that magazine you know, anybody that was a stop motion fan pretty much saw it. And, um, yeah, I guess he just, he f finished that just like maybe two or three years ago or something. I, I think that when, or he remastered it or, or something, I mean, he was always posting stuff about it for a while. And it looked really awesome. Like, I, I don't even remember how he got all his apples to sparkle the way they sparkled and stuff. But I guess he sort of, after so many years, embraced the digital aspect of it. Maybe he used After Effects or, or something similar. But um, yeah, it's that was a really cool film. I mean, there's there are a lot of really great older films that I think um, you know it's it's sad that a lot of films that were made on film um, are just you know they're they won't be transferred digitally ever. Like Meet the Raisins from Wolbitten Studios, that was always one of my favorite you know, projects, and I drew a lot of inspiration from that, and, um, you know, I remember, you know, trying to emulate the sculpting style, and um, just collecting any sort of images, and, you know, recording videos on VHS, like all the TV specials and stuff like that, I would record just because I wanted to keep it and watch it over and over like five million times. So that's something I did and uh, you know it was it was like when you found something that was stop motion related back then it was really more precious than it is today I think. I mean people take for granted the fact that the internet you could just go on there and you know watch literally hours of stop motion if you wanted to. There's a lot of you know, pirated videos out there. 
you can watch all the Brothers Quay stuff, Jans, Fankmeyer. You just like, you know, quick search, couple of clicks, and it's all right there. And when, you know, when Ron and I were growing up, and I think Ron, Ron's a little bit older than I am, but, you know, I, I was born in 75, so the whole 1980s, when I was really young, and into the 90s, stuff like that was pretty sparse until the internet came online and then you know people started sharing work and communicating about different projects they were working on and nobody really understood um, how to do stop motion very well like as a whole you know and stop motion capture software wasn't really out there so much so You know, it's like, what did you do? Well, you could like buy a, a lunchbox, uh, Animation Toolworks lunchbox, capture things that way. Uh, Super 8 was still kind of, it was on the way out, heavily on the way out by like 1995 or so. But you could still get it developed and you could still project it and everything. So there were like the remnants of film, which were still out there. You could still kind of you know do stop motion using the chemical process and then digital cameras were starting to be created and but the quality was really bad so uh, and then trying to to stitch pictures together and everything was um, there were not a lot of ways to do it so now there's you know stop motion pro there's dragon frame there's you know, just tons there, I think like um, Monkey Jam was really popular for a while. That was like one of the first stop motion capture programs was Monkey Jam. We also carried some, uh, there's like Helium Frog Animator, which was out and wasn't updated. So that kind of sort of went to the wayside. Anasazi was also, I think Anasazi was the first PC capture program that was created. And it was, you know, for free. It's a free program, but um, you can you can do some basic things with it with the web camera and stuff. So uh, so Ron says he began a sequel several years ago after I finished my film. It inspired him. I haven't posted my first animation film ever yet. My friend from high school sent it to me, and I keep meaning to post it. I should do that soon. Ron is saying he's born in '65. There was no internet for most of his life. And Puff Puff says, I was born in 74. Love all the specials, too. And Ron says, I still have my Super 8 camera. All the careers of those from my generation began in that format. <laughs> yeah, I have my 16mm uh, Kodak Cine special. And I did use a Super 8 for a while. And I borrowed it from Mike McKinney, who uh, he was my, one of my first contacts in the business. Very nice guy, and he really helped me out a lot. He he sold me some uh, some lighting equipment from Wolvitten Studios, like three inch for three inch for nails, and uh, I think he sold me three of the light stands that they used at the studio. You know, it was pretty awesome. And then uh, Webster Colcord sold me some equipment, so I sort of you know from my contacts was able to build up a little arsenal of. Um, abilities, you know, different abilities, lighting abilities, and um, but yeah, he Mike McKinney gave me a uh, Kodak Super 8 film camera, and it worked really good. I mean, it, it was like my first work was um, done that way, and then I went to a, a place in St. Louis that transferred it over to VHS and then on VHS I was able to you know uh, make copies of everything and make a demo reel for you know trying to find work so the place in St. Louis was called CCD CCD Productions um, they they did all kinds of stuff for people but um, 
these days, you know, I don't even know if they're still around. I mean, they probably are. But, I mean, people are so good at using things like Photoshop and After Effects and Sony Vegas and all that a lot of that stuff that they were doing was really almost impossible for the average person to do back then in terms of computing power and all that. So, you know, most of the old technologies that were there, people that were working in them and really good at it, you know, they must have moved on. Or, you know, just adapted to the change of technology and digital and and all of that because, like I say, nowadays anybody can get, you know, any kind of program either and it, it's unfortunate, you know, but if you're poor, people go on the internet and they get uh, pirated software. I'm pretty sure that they're, like they're pirating the Stop Motion Pro and Dragon Frame too. I'm pretty sure that's being pirated. Um, you know, pretty much any program, even like ZBrush, which is, I think that I paid... Uh, 800 bucks for that myself you know I did pay for it it took me a while to save up and it was one of the, the greatest purchases for me you know in terms of my business I was able to use that and it paid for itself after just like one project but um, you know it's like the availability of even expensive programs like that is really anybody can get it if they want to um, let's see here. so what am I doing here so I got hmm so the question is how will I texture this how did I texture this one so it looks like I used these my special texture tool here it is Here's my special raft shaped tool that I made. I have a piece of brass uh, wire. I'm just going to kind of go in here and make some bark texture. Sort of looks like hair texture or something, but that's kind of how a tree looks. Going here. But um so the point I was trying to make about that with pirating stuff is that just the ease of access that is, you know, for most people that can use a computer um cuts down on the need for, you know, hiring people anymore to do specialized video editing and transferring and stuff. But there used to be whole industries just around what you could do with Photoshop and After Effects. I mean, like, just just adding titles on something back then, like a, a really uh, nice, crisp, digital-looking title, was near impossible. I mean, you could... That's why most of the artists that made stop-motion films... I mean, even to this day, you, you could still do it, but... Uh, they would, you know, use their artistic abilities to make some sort of intro or, or title or whatever. Um, you know, like if you create, it's like, you know, this film is animated by Ron Cole, you know, and just trying to, to do that required a lot of ingenuity and, and trying to solve problems where you know, nowadays you just whip out Photoshop, use the text tool, look up a font, get a free font somewhere, and that's it. You've got yourself a nice, easy to read. Um, you know, fancy font, written uh, title. You can even make your own lettering in there and resize it however you want like back then you know you would have to make sure that you 
he wrote things in such a way that the, the camera could see it so it had to be a certain scale and everything or and uh, you would use like Xerox machines to make things bigger and smaller <laughs> I mean the Xerox machine was used extensively I remember at Gentleman Films they used the Xerox machine um, on their uh, Henry Cycle special a lot I mean, so much so that they actually bought one. They had one in their office, you know, just for the, the sake of um, making things larger and smaller for fitting, you know, in the, in the camera view. And In fact, uh, this film here, I, I did that same thing. Actually, I can show you guys. Let me see. So... Now I'm, I'm using, uh, I'm going to be using Moho to animate this. You can see here what I did was I actually set my camera up on my clay on glass rig and it's kind of hard to tell. But what I did is I took this piece of uh, foam board or poster board and on each layer of glass uh, there would be a certain size area that the camera could see right so I boxed it out and this is the top layer mid layer and bottom layer of glass so I knew that if I make a set like which, which I'm doing here right it has to be laid out on this sort of um, field of view guide and so the bottom layer is large right larger because it's farther from the camera so it can see more space more area so um, I had to make sure that the backgrounds that I make are larger than that by just a little bit so that the camera will be able to see within, within that range. And so I did this when I was starting out. And since I'm using Moho now to do the animation and compositing, uh, I do not have to worry about that. Get this back here, hopefully I don't drop my stuff. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's that's the old way to do it. And nowadays, you know, using Moho, it's going to be much easier. So Ron says, high tech when I was growing up was backwinding, compositing on Super 8 for those capable of pulling that off. Yep. Those were the dangerous times in stop motion history. <laughs> it's like... You know, oh, I want to have some sparks in my shot or something. Let me backwind my camera. And you're like, how many frames is it that I got to backwind? And you count like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's like, oh wait, was that nine or ten? You know. Yeah, that was that was scary stuff. <laughs> All right, so now that I've done this, let's plop our tree on our set here. Um, I'm going to have to get this out of the way. I'm going to have to prop up the tree a little bit because it's bowed because it's laying on top of the other surfaces. I want it to be kind of... I don't want it to, to look that way. So I'm just going to kind of go on the back. Oh down there yeah I remember the the first time I backwound one of my one of my cameras for uh, teddy bears mistake and what I did was uh, I wanted to have sparks I wanted to have like electrical shocks that brought my skeleton to life and I backwound it and um, and I took these little uh, what are they called um, fuses for for fireworks. And I use, I put the fuse in the set. And I I used like black felt everywhere, making everything dark. And so I put this the sparks in there. You know, I lit the fuse and 
took some individual frames while it was lit. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it set off all the, the fire alarms and everything in my house. And of course, your parents kind of are like, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> It's like, well, I want to have sparks. Let's see here. So, yeah, I don't think I would do it that way today. I mean, I could do it that way, and it would look pretty awesome. I mean, I, I do like the look of it. In fact, um, Webster Colcord, I know he he has been transferring a lot of his old 16 millimeter footage onto a uh, digital media. So what they're doing is like taking the, the individual strips of film and scanning each frame and then compiling it into animation. And it actually looks pretty good, you know? I mean, if you digitally um, transfer your your 16 millimeter into 4k images you can see like the, the individual grains of film and now I, I think that I mean it kind of requires some tweaking to make it look really uh, like there's like the contrast I noticed the company he was using I think the contrast was bumped up or bumped down I don't know it, it was really washed out a lot of the stuff So if you want to really make it look good, you still have to digitally fix it up, which is I think what Ron was saying. Like he's like uh, having some color correction done. Gentleman Films, uh, John is color correcting things. So it's I mean, it's digital or film, it's still the, the same rules still apply. Let me see here. So. The base of the tree, I'm gonna have grass. Get some green clay here. Hmm. So which color was it? It's this one. Okay. Hey, Randy, welcome back. So this here is going to require a little bit of detailing because I've got to cover the entire base of the tree with grass. It's got to look good. Definitely getting exciting. I'm pretty pretty excited to get to the animation phase phase of this. And probably what I'm gonna do. So how much longer will it take for me to finish this one up? Um So I guess after I finish like this tree and I'm gonna add little bushes back here and stuff. Hey, don't do that cat. Um, I'm going to have to go through and see what kind of props I need to build because there are some props that have to be made like shovels and picks and things like that and the tombstone and also like a little I don't know if I'm going to make a close up of this or not this particular set I think I might need to storyboard things out a bit I've got some, some rough storyboards sketched, but I'm not really sure in terms of details what I want to do. Like I might, for some shots, uh, I might take like sections of this green and the texture and, and zoom in with my camera and snap photos and di either di digitally manipulate that or I might just make a whole new set for one of the, the shots where so the, the first mother has to look across at the people over here. And so the angle would be from her perspective would be facing in you know this direction. 
So whatever is back here has to be seen. Um, so I'll have to figure out what I want that to look like. So the tree would be in there, but what's behind it? You know, I'm not really sure. I, I know what, what partly what it will be, but because uh, it will be the, one of the main castles that I made. So I can show you guys. Okay, sort of smushed some of this clay moving in this before, but uh, this is one of the castles. This will be where the king, this door will open up here and he'll kind of come out. There's like a little drawbridge, you know, and this is the village. So this will be definitely behind everything, but I'm thinking of maybe having like trees over here, maybe some trees over here, just something to kind of fill that in. Or do I want trees? Hmm. So I mean, this one tree, if I, if it's just one tree, it seems more precious, you know? So maybe that's all they have is one. Um, I'm not really sure what I want to do with that. But I gotta, I gotta give it some thought. <laughs> yeah, so Randy's saying the the light looks like a, a moon rising or something. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it's kind of... Um, let's see if I can... Yeah, that's the one bad thing about this setup is the glare. Here's the moon... Sure, what my son sees upstairs. So yes, lots of grass, lots and lots of grass here. And looking at this, so I'm looking at it on my my web camera view. So this looks like it's kind of deep. This line. Maybe I should add a few more just to kind of. So it looks almost like there's one stray deep line and the rest is kind of shallow. So just a couple more lines here. Deep one. There we go. Kind of makes it nicer. Now one of the things that as a sculptor you'll find is that if you're not bold enough, everything kind of tends to look um, too simple, you know? Like you want to add a variety of depth to your textures. And sometimes like if I'm sculpting, um, it's not really a conscious, it's like a subconscious thing where you're almost afraid to make things too bold or you know, make the lines too deep. You know, that's that's always one of the things that I had to overcome in my sculptures is not being bold enough. So, I mean, it might be different for everybody else out there, but it's something to think about when you're working on things like this is, you know, are you are you making the lines deep enough? Are you making the um, are you tr playing it too safe? You know. Are there enough colors? You know, is it two? Are there just like two colors? Is it enough? Do you need more? You need to always sort of constantly reevaluate what you're doing, and that way you don't have as many regrets. You know, <laughs> it's like once you commit it to film, once you take pictures of it. I mean, you may look at it later and say, oh. You know, why didn't I do this or that or something? I mean, why couldn't I have maybe added more colors to that bark? It would have looked better. 
but I use just one color, you know, or, or something like that. So you're always kind of thinking about all the possibilities and don't be afraid to, you know, make changes. I know with this, I'll probably need to add a few more um, colors of green. I think this is not enough. It is two different colors, but I probably will add a, a few stray, like lighter green strands of, or blades of grass. see here so uh ron says every time i go to my local art store i think of randy it, um it, it's across the street from bob's furniture store <laughs> and randy says i do go to art stores but i don't recall ever buying furniture from a bob <laughs> and ron says didn't you animate the original ad for bob's maybe i have the name confused uh hold on a sec So my son saw a cat and got very excited and had to tell me about it there. Um, so, uh, Mary says, nope, wasn't me. So now when you go to the art store, you'll always think of me and that I didn't do what you thought I did. <laughs> ah, okay, Michael Bannon. It looks, he says it looks like, like Randy stuff. <laughs> Yeah, it is easy to get, conf you know, it, there are people that have similar styles to Randy. Yeah, Michael Bannon's a really good, good animator. I think he has a lot of followers, YouTube followers. Okay, so this looks pretty cool. I'm afraid that the tree is a little bit I'm gonna flatten this out. I'm gonna have to retexturize it, but that's okay. And texture is easy. Oops. <laughs> I just made a mistake and my first thought in my mind was control Z, control Z. You can tell I've been sculpting too much on ZBrush when that happens. There's no control Z in real life. Uh, I should probably explain. So if you guys don't know, um, Control Z and ZBrush is the undo, is undo. And in fact, uh, a lot of programs, even in Photoshop, if you make a mistake and you you press con Control Z, it will undo what you did. All right. So we got our, ourselves some grass here to sort of hide where the tree goes into the ground. So kind of make some blades of grass. I'll show you guys a close up. Yeah, there it is. So it's sort of like Bruce Bickford's work, you know, this he did a lot of things like this. A lot of little detailed work. So, let's see here. So, what can I do to make this look a little bit 
more. I don't know what more what. More what, Mark? More randomized, more natural, maybe. So I'm gonna add just a few little stray, lighter green colored blades of grass. So maybe one right here. That looks actually pretty good. All right. Although you don't, you can't really see it on the webcam, but having some variety, a variety of colors is always a good thing. I have to say, I really like the green colored clays. I think green is an awesome color anyway, but. Something just about seeing a bunch of clay, you know, like looking at the colors, different green colors. It just, uh, I guess because I've been sculpting for so many years, it's sort of like a sentimental feeling that you get when you work with it. I mean, I've, I've always loved sculpting and Yeah, kind of a weird thing. The brain is a very strange mechanism mechanism of organic computation. So, um, let's see here. Um, hey Dylan, how come? <laughs> um, Ron says, well, at least I don't feel bad for you anymore. They went with CGI for those ads since then. I hate when Stop Mo gets booted for computer junk. Oh, yeah. There are some really junky computerized ads that I've seen. Especially here in the Midwest. You know, there's not a lot of people that do it properly. And it's not like there's any kind of Pixar in, in the Midwest or anything. But sometimes you see these car ads and stuff that just, they have these really super junky looking simplified uh, mascots that they come up with, you know. It's like, come on down to Bill's Auto Place and buy yourself a $200 car. Free air freshener upon purchase. You know, and they'll have like some mascot that says that and um, like a cowboy hat and a giant mustache or something and it moves almost like it's it's sliding around and flying or something on ice or you know doesn't move well it, it's just like the worst garbage and i understand people try and you know it's not really nice to make fun of artists that do stuff like that but um if you compare it to to like the domino's pizza noid or something like that it's just like wow there's a People don't put as much pride into into their work as they used to. Of course, that's a very gen general thing. Like I'm almost almost being like um, anti-animation or something when I say that, but it's it's true in some cases, and it's like you you have this potential to make something cool, and you don't. Because it's cheaper, you know, it's like a money thing and there's so many awesome artists that are like, yeah, I would love to make advertisements. I have all these amazing abilities and, but the problem is you got to charge money for that and a lot of people don't want to pay, you know, for what, what you're worth. All right, so I'm just going to go in here and actually, uh, I know I re I added texture on here. And I'm destroying it because what I want to do is I want to add some a few colors of brown just to break this up a little bit. Just to make it look natural. Not too simple. Like I said, you don't want regrets. You don't want to do something so half-assed that later on you're like, oh, I should have at least done 
you know, added some more colors to that or textures. Unfortunately, there was like a streak of yellow in that brown, which it's almost too light colored now. Get rid of that. So uh, Midwest doesn't matter. I've seen crappy CGI ads here in New York. Oh yeah, even in New York. I mean, New York is like a super huge hub of creativity. They have all the amazing art colleges there and stuff in the city so that's not very nice to hear but I guess it shouldn't surprise me too much I wonder what the Kyoto brothers are up to I think that um they were working on that dinosaur project, like the uh, walking with dinosaurs thing. So they were making like these hand puppet sort of dinosaurs and dinosaur suits and things so that you could see what it would be like to be around real dinosaurs. All right, so now, trying to see if I like this here or not. I think it's pretty good. For the most part, let's see, put this here. So I want to put some oil on my brush so I don't make a mess. All right. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to blend everything together, but I think I put too much oil on it. Now it's shiny. So Randy says, haven't found a clip yet, but spotted a still of Bannon with some cool looking puppets. I can see a resemblance. And Ron says, free green software is Blender 3D. It's very hard to learn. I can help if you contact me privately. Ah. And Ron is saying Natron is also free. That's easier, but not as good without plugins. So I've got Sony Vegas. Yeah, I find that works pretty good, actually. Um, I mean, there's, I guess you can use uh, Premiere to do that. That was what I originally used was Adobe Premiere. But I found that the green screen option, at least on the version I had, was really, it worked, but it was pretty horrible, to be honest. It was not very good at all. Not very good, and so I ditched that one for... And I was originally editing my entire film using Premiere Zombie Pirate Tales, and had a lot of it edited really well. It wasn't done yet, and um, so what happened was I got uh, Sony Vegas for like 50 bucks or so, and experimented with it in the, in the green screen worked about you know ten times better and some of the shots that I did I didn't use green I used pink behind some of the, the sets because I had uh, green and blue in some of the objects that I made and because of that you can't use green or blue as your background your chroma key background and so I had this like neon pink uh, poster board or like cardboard stuff really thick cardboard from I think from Walgreens or someplace and I put that behind a sh one of my ships that I animated alright this is probably pretty good now 
see what time it is. Oh, man, that took me a while. But um, the the Sony Vegas just it took that pink out of the the shot and it was nice and crisp and clean and everything. And Premiere couldn't do that, so I ended up having to you know transfer all of my video from Premiere and then I opened it up in Sony Vegas and had to re-edit everything. It was a real pain in the butt. So Zombie Pirate Tales, I finished the the episode that I was making. You can see it on my YouTube channel. But my the idea of using like using that to pitch to a company like Leica or someplace to pick up and continue, or to make a series of films, you know, I I just realized that I didn't have enough space in the garage to build a second ship and do all that I wanted to do. Unfortunately, so um, basically the the project is it's dead for now. There's nothing I can do with it. And so, that is the way it is. But uh, I was really proud of the final piece. And who knows, maybe one day if, if when I retire or something, I'll pick it back up. <laughs> so, let me see here. So, okay, it looks like this, for some reason, Puff Puff had this message deleted automatically, so I just made it visible. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool, Dylan. I hope you liked it. I mean, it just it took forever to create, and real life got in the way. You know, having gotten married when I first started making it, and I got married at the point when I started to make it, and uh, having a son and getting him into school and preschool and you know that just that changed everything for me Let's see here so I wasn't really able to focus on that film like I wanted to and you know now I, I have you know this project that I'm working on which is you know it is the way it is it's flat and everything is simple for a reason and that's because I don't have enough space to really do a larger project with you know big puppets and all that I can but I can only make like a like a small area like one set or something um, having large pirate ships and everything with tons of puppets on there was just you know I just I should have planned things out better or thought that through before I, I got too far in, into that but then again originally we were gonna you know make that into a into a 20 plus minute film and the plan was to actually hire people and to rent a space you know so that we could take the the large set and or sets you know two different ships Plus, there were other sets that were going to be built, like islands and things like that. Uh, so originally, like, the, the plan just... Things didn't go the way I wanted it to. I mean, I really couldn't have foreseen the way things were going to turn out. So my, my intentions were good, but the stars were not aligned properly, I guess. All right, so I'm just kind of going in here and making things a little bit more bold in terms of all these textures, so that it looks good to the eye. Like right when I, you know, when I look at it, I did kind of make all this stuff uniform. Not enough variety of depth, so I'm just going through. I can't believe it took me one hour to, to make this tree and this grass. <laughs> Is that crazy? So next week, um, we're definitely gonna, gonna have to make the top part here, the, the bushy aspect of the tree, which is pretty big. And we're gonna have to figure out a texture for that. And 
maybe I need to whip out some of my old texture pads and do something like, you know, stamp it with, because I've got one that's like a concrete texture pad, almost like they took a brick. Um, I got it from Bourbon Industries and it's like they took a brick and they poured the, the rubber on it and so the texture is really heavy. I think that would be pretty good for something like this. That way I can just sort of like press it into it and get a nice texture and then I can add little leaves and things and details to make it, you know, so your brain knows that it's a tree. There we go. I mean, it looks pretty cool though, I have to say. I'm not to brag about myself, but I think that's what I was, you know, I had in my brain is what I actually got in clay. So in that regards, it's a success. Okay, so let's see here, four minutes left. I think this is all right. Might just add just a few more little blades of grass here. Maybe I can just like, not just little blades, but little spheres that I press in there. The proper tool. So I've got indentations, got little blobs, got little, little of everything on here. I will show you guys a close up before we go so you can see the progress. And so you'll have to just kind of sort of imagine, you know, this will be a large bushy tree up above, much bigger than this with all the red apples in there. So the magic is gonna be when we put all this together in, in the computer. And uh, so here's where the, here you can see the grass. So again, like I said before, you don't wanna make the, the texture too uniform like I had it before, so I kinda, of, broke that up and um, added some deeper lines in there like that the tree you know it's got some deep lines some shallow lines and I also added just a few strips on there of lighter colored brown so it looks a little bit more natural kind of neat I mean I'm just kind of envisioning it on the camera here like having the characters around the tree you know, eating apples and stuff. So I might actually not have to make a close-up set. I could actually zoom in maybe on this. And the characters around it still would look pretty good, I think. Almost like an abstract set, you know. And you can't really tell it's super flat either. It look, I mean, you can, I mean, you can, but it has a nice amount of depth to it. All right, so just another thought here. I've been thinking about the background here behind it, which we've got like these rolling hills and all that will be done in Krita. I've got, uh, I downloaded some free brushes off Krita, which are really cool. They're almost like watercolors, the way that they paint, you know, the way that they, um, they kind of come out of the digital paint brush, whatever you want to call it. Um, I also ordered a, a new tablet because the tablet that I use is really tiny. I've got a really super small Wacom tablet. Not sure if I can stretch it out. Let me see here. Mm, like, well, yeah, I can. So you can see here the, the space is like four by six inches or something like that. And this is more for a CRT monitor. This is, you know, the like a four by three ratio. So using this on a, a modern screen, it just doesn't, you move your pen over to here, and in Krita, once you get to like this area here, it pops out off to the side of the screen. So my actual workable area is like maybe 
three by you know three by four or something like that in here <laughs> so I can't really paint in that program very well so um, I did get a, a new tablet which was about 70 bucks it's like a, a knockoff of a Wacom tablet and it has good reviews so I'm gonna see how it works out but uh, I will be painting um, everything behind the horizon line here now I'm gonna also, I'm gonna, this is gonna be clay here like the bridge and stuff in the water most likely but Everything back here will be, you know, rolling green hills with, with this sort of watercolor um, brush that I got. And I might, see I've got some, some clouds that I made out of clay. But I don't know if I'll use clay. I think the abstract will be better. Sort of like what if you watch a Bambi, the Bambi cartoon from Disney. They sort of have just, it's, it's not very super detailed or anything. It's just an impression of what it would be. So anyway, that's kind of the plan. I have a lot of ideas and like I say, it's getting exciting now because it's this is the last main major set that I gotta build. And everything else is just about done. So anyways, uh, I do appreciate you guys stopping by and um, you know coming here just to chat for a little while. I know that you know it's kind of I don't know if it's exciting to watch watch me clay or uh, sculpt in clay or not but um, anyway it's pretty fun for me I know that much so I will see you guys uh, next week see you all later